I love the book of Psalms because you, you can read through the book of Psalms and you can find every emotion known to man. There's anger, sadness, vindictiveness, fear, joy. Like I mean, you, you just list them, and every single emotion is found in the book of Psalms. There, there is no emotion or feeling that you can have that you won't find in one of the 150 Psalms. And I love, I love Psalm 137, which, which is a, it's a weird psalm to love. And if, if, if I was on a TV show right now, and like this was a TV show, I'd, I'd kind of put up the words, kind of like a flash forward and put like 600 years in the future, because that's what I want to do right here. Psalm 137, it's not our text, you don't need to turn there, but I just, I just want you to hear this. It says, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars, we hung our harps. For there, our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. But how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Remember, Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundations. Daughter Babylon, doomed to destruction. Happy is the one who repays you according to what you've done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. If we could only look into the future and, and see the result of some of our choices and see what the result of some of our choices would be it might cause us to, to make a different choice in the past. I, I don't know if you've ever had one of these moments where kind of by the rivers of Babylon you sat and wept when, when you thought about your brokenness, when you thought about your sin, when you thought about the choices that you've made and only, man, if I could just go back, I would do something so much different I don't know if you've been there. I have. I remember I was, I was 21 years old, and I, I, I don't know if, if you've gotten to, the, to, the, to a point in your life where you can look back and say, man, what I thought I wanted so bad, that, that was the last thing that I needed. I, I mean, I was so convinced that, that, that I needed it, that, that this thing would, would just satisfy every craving in my life, and, and everything would be great if I just had this one thing. But sometimes what we think we want is the last thing that we need. I remember I was 21 years old. I'd never dated in high school because I was awkward and nerdy and ugly. And I thought, man, if I just get a girlfriend, everything will just be so much better. I will finally be complete. So I finally did get a girlfriend. And, and it, she wasn't the right type of girl that, that I should have been seeking after. But it was after, you know, we dated a few months, then uh, we end up moving in together, then we end up getting engaged, and then everything just goes, everything just goes terrible. My, my relationship with my family is, is, is awful, like I'm not, I'm not in church anymore, I'm, I'm not living under the lordship of Jesus. And I had a moment as, as I'm moving my stuff out of the apartment that we shared in kind of my first act of repentance... I had this moment where I just sat on the bed and I just, I started weeping. It's the, and, and I don't even know what caused it. Like, I'm not a crier. I can probably count on one hand the, the times I've actually cried in my life. But the tears just started coming and I just started weeping and, and they wouldn't stop. Like, my parents are helping me move stuff out of the apartment. They're like, what in the world is wrong with you? And they, they don't know what's going on, but I'm just sitting there, and I, I had one of these moments, like, it's like by the rivers of Babylon, you know, we sat and wept when, when we thought about our life before, and we thought about the choices that we make, and if only we could go back, we would do something different. Have you been there? Have you ever said, man, that thing that I thought I wanted so bad, that was the last thing that I needed you know, when I read Psalm 137 and you read about the heartbreak, what I want to do is, is, is I can take you back. Psalm 137 wouldn't have happened without 1 Samuel chapter 8 when, when Israel says, give us a king. 
We want a human king, just like all of the other nations have. Give us a king. That is what we want. We want to be like everyone else. See, the direct event that leads to Psalm 137 happened some 600 years prior. Last week, we kind of talked about the book of Judges. We talked about Samson. And here's how the book of Judges ends. It's the last verse, Judges 21, 25. It says, in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Now, I don't know about you, but when I do as I see fit, I do what I think is right, man, it goes terrible. Because I'm not a very good judge of what is right. You know, I have to admit. It says in, Solomon writes in Proverbs 14, 12, he says, there's a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. I, I can testify to that. Because we are so fallen and we are so sinful that even, even what looks to be right for us is completely often so wrong, it's not even funny. So judges ends, everyone's doing what they see is right. They don't really have a leader. God isn't even their leader anymore. And everyone is just doing what they see fit, and it is going terrible. Israel's in complete disarray. They are in terrible shape. And it's not just the people of Israel, it's even the priests of Israel. And this is what happens when you abandon Scripture, when you abandon the law of the Lord. You know, a lot Scripture, scripture needs to be up here. We, we need to be down here. We need to be in... in Scripture needs to be our authority, but what happens sometimes is, is we, we swap places and we put our own lives and our own experiences and our own desires over Scripture when really it, it needs to be way up here. And that's what's happened after the book of Judges. Everyone's abandoned the Word. Everyone's abandoned the Lord. This goes on for about 400 years. But then after the 400 years of the book of Judges is over, after Samson, God raises up a leader in the most unlikely of places. It's a barren womb. He, he raises up a leader from a barren womb. If there's something more hopeless than a barren womb, I don't know what it is. We meet this woman named Hannah, and it says in, in first, the second part of 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 5, it says, And the Lord had closed her womb. I want you to notice that. Now, this is no small deal back then. It's not a small deal today. She's picked on by her husband's other wife. Oh, you don't have any kids. I've got all these kids. You can't have kids. And she's, she's pretty miserable. Her, her life's just miserable. But, but here's what I want us to notice. When God closes a womb, God can also open a womb. See, many times in Scripture, God brings hope into these hopeless situations so that he can glorify himself. You know, so many times we fight against what we're going through. We fight against the, the sacrifice that we make, and we fight against the suffering that we go through. And we think, God, if you just take this away, man, my life would be so much better, be so much easier, I'd be closer to you. But no, we, we forget that whatever we go through, God may be intending to use it for his glory. You, you look in John chapter 9, and John writes about this blind man that, that Jesus meets. And the disciples ask, hey, Jesus, you know, who sinned? Was it this guy or was it his parents you know, that he was caused to be born blind? And Jesus is like, Jesus is going to heal him, but he says, nobody sinned. Like this happened, he was born blind so that God might, might display his greatness through him, like that God might be glorified through his blindness. And he closes Hannah's womb so that he can open it later in the, in the way that's most going to glorify himself. And we may not like that, like, I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm reading that, and it's like, man, why do you close the womb? That doesn't seem fair. Like, that doesn't seem kind. But we completely forget that God is always going to do what he does so that he gets the most glory at the end of the day. Like, it's not about us. It's, it's all about God. So Hannah prays. She really wants a child. And listen to her prayer. You find it in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 10. And it says this, it says, in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. 
I mean, what do you notice when you read that prayer, when you hear that prayer? That, that's about the most completely unselfish prayer that, that you'll find in Scripture. She, she asks for this gift. She asks for this baby. Not really for herself. She asks for, for this baby so she can turn around and give him right back to God in service to him. Like, I don't know if there's a more pure prayer than that. That you find. I mean, who prays for something just so they can give it away? I mean, she basically just prays for a servant for the Lord. And God's going to honor this prayer. And if you think about it, she almost prays for the child that Samson was supposed to be. If you remember, you know, angel of the Lord comes to, comes to Samson's parents and, and, and tells them, hey, you're going to, God's going to open your womb. He's going to do a miracle. You're going to have a baby. And then he gives them all these rules for how the baby's going to be a Nazarite. You know, don't shave his head. Don't, put, don't get him around the fruit of the vine, all that stuff. Don't let him touch the dead. But that was God's instructions for Samson. Now you get Hannah praying, saying that she herself will devote this child to the Lord. And then she'll turn around and give him right back to God. So God opens her womb. He allows her to become pregnant. And she makes good on her vow. After she weans Samuel, Samuel basically means God heard my prayer. She brings him to a town called Shiloh, and she puts him in service to the Lord. And she leaves. And then she only, she only sees him once a year as, as he's growing up. Kind of breaks your heart a little bit. The text talks about how, how she brings him a little new robe every year. And each year the robes get a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. But how, how many of us would do that? You finally get the baby or, or the thing that you pray for. How many of us would give it up? I, mean, I know we said we'd give it up. God, if you just give me this baby, I will turn around and I will give, give him right back to you. He'll be in service to you all the days of his life. But, man, I, I think it would be really hard if I got that thing I really wanted and God actually opened my prayer and I've, I've got it physically in front of me. I'm just being honest, it'd be really hard for me, even though I said I'd give it up, to give it up. But, but, but Hannah, she, she does what she said she would do. Her, her miracle child, she gives him up to the Lord. She gives up her treasure. And Samuel grows up under the guidance of, of a priest named Eli. And what the author of 1 Samuel keeps doing is he keeps pointing out how different Samuel is from the culture around him. You, know, you get 2 Samuel um, verse seven, chapter 2, verse 17, says, The sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's eyes, talking about Eli's sons, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. But Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. You know, as opposed to Eli's sons, the author wants you to point out how silly this little boy, this, this Samuel looked, He's wearing this, this ephod, kind of looks like he's playing dress up. While you've got, you know, Eli's sons who are Hophni and Phinehas are their names. They're, they're supposed to be priests. And, you know, they're wearing their outfits and everything, but they're completely corrupt. And then you've got, you've got, you've got little Samuel over here who, who's more righteous than these two. 1 Samuel 2, 26, and I'm just going through here. You don't need to, you don't need to turn it. 1 Samuel 2, 26 says, The boy Samuel continues to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with people. 1 Samuel 3, 1, The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare, and there were not many visions. Now, this is important. Because God is going to speak to this child. He's going to speak to Samuel and it's like, why? Like, there's not many visions. Nobody's really hearing from God. Why does he speak to this kid? And it's because this child is completely different than everyone around him. He's completely different even than most of the priests. And because he's not like everyone else, God is going to speak to him, and God's going to work through him. See, the, the voice of the Lord was rare in these times because there's nobody seeking him. There's nobody listening to him. They've elevated themselves over the word. And you get to chapter 3, verse 19, and it says this. It says, The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. 
The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. And Samuel's word came to all Israel. This is what I want us to see. Because Samuel is completely different than the people around him, God is going to use him to speak to the people around him. He he has a different voice. And it's no coincidence that the author of 1 Samuel keeps contrasting Samuel with all of the people all around him. And he keeps pointing out that he's different. That's the point. And it's no coincidence that God speaks to Samuel about Eli the priest and what's going to happen in in Eli's life and his family. And he doesn't even speak to Eli. Like that's, That's on purpose. Eli has, has lived his life as a priest. He knows what his kids are doing. His sons were like taking the, the food from the, the offerings and eating it for themselves and getting the best pieces. And they're sleeping with all the women you know, outside the tent of meeting. And they're just completely taking advantage of their position as priests. And Eli doesn't stop them. I mean, he says a couple things to them. Like, boys, you shouldn't be doing this. But he doesn't stop them. He full well knows what's going on. And because of what's happening, God is going to judge that family. And because he can't speak to the priest, he speaks to a child. So, so here's what's been happening so far. Just to recap, a couple hundred years of history here. Moses dies. Right? Joshua takes over as Israel's leader. People follow Joshua while he's alive. All, and all the elders who were with Joshua were alive. But after they die, people stop following the Lord. And even though they're in the promised land, God starts allowing all these other nations to come in and attack and oppress them because they've not kept their terms of the covenant. When they cry out to God, finally they get tired of the way they're living. God sends them judges to fight for them. And as long as the judge is alive, they keep keep the faith. But when the judge dies, they completely go back into idolatry and God puts them into servitude to other nations. And they cry out to God. This is a vicious cycle for 400 years. You would think they would learn, but they don't. People of Israel keep getting further and further away from God. They keep putting their hope in people, and it never works out well for them. So now, up until this point, Moses is, or excuse me, Israel's been led by Moses, by Joshua, by different judges, and Samuel is sort of their last judge. But, but they get to this point where they start looking around at all of these other nations, all these nations that keep coming in and conquering them, and they notice the one thing that they all have in common. They're like, oh, they, they all have a king. They, they've all got like a monarchy. They, they've got a physical person who leads them that they can put their hope in. And they think, man, if only we had a king to lead us, then, then everything would be great. If only we had a king, then everything would work out. We could put our hope in this king, and this king will never let us down. And then we'll be like all of the other nations around us. God, God, we want to be like everyone else around us. We don't want to be different. We want to be like the culture around us. I mean, do, do you hear what they're saying? What they're effectively saying in different words is, we don't want to be the people of God. God, we want to look just like everyone around us. We don't want to clear out the promised land. We want to look just like everyone else in it. We don't want to be different. We don't want you to lead us, God. We want a human leader. We know best, God. Now, it's easy to kind of talk about them and how stupid that is at the end of the day, but but do we ever do that? It's like, God, I know you say this, but but I'm going to do this. God, I know you said I need to forgive that person, but you don't know what they did to me. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay bitter and I'm going to stay angry and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat them like garbage. Or God, I, I know I'm supposed to, you know, I'm supposed to die to myself, but, but surely you don't really mean I'm, I'm supposed to die to myself. Like surely, surely I can have some comfort in this life. But we, we don't ever do that, do you? God, God, I know it says I'm not supposed to grumble, but I'm, I'm, I've just got these couple of friends I grumble to all the time, and it makes me feel a lot better. No, I'm not supposed to gossip, but God, you don't know what that person did. It just makes me feel so much better when I can talk about it to everyone else, and then I, I kind of unburden myself. God, I know you say this, but I want to do this. 
Oh, I'm glad they're nothing like us. And despite everything that Samuel has done during his time as their leader, they still want to reject God. And I mean, he's done quite a bit as their leader. The ark gets taken. You know, Samuel gets it back from the Philistines. He's able to get the people to, to briefly turn back to God. But even he's not able to help them now. And, and you look at 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 6. It says, when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It's not you they've rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they've done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Then you get to verse 19. It says, but the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. Man. And when you read this, you don't realize that this is the beginning of the end for the United Kingdom of Israel. The people have no idea what they are asking for. Sure, they'll get a king. And he looks the part. Man, King Saul, the first king of Israel. Man, nobody ever looked so much like a king than Saul. But Saul falls and Saul fails. And then comes King David, this great man after God's own heart. But even he falls and he fails. And then you get David's son Solomon. He becomes king. He's the wisest person to ever live. And even he fails and he falls. I mean, do you see the theme? No human leader can lead Israel where they need to go. And after Solomon reigns, after he dies, the kingdom splits in two. Israel's divided from the north and the south. Northern kingdom uh, is Israel. The southern kingdom is Judah. And each has a different king to lead them. Where there was once unity, now it's completely divided. Almost like a civil war happened. And many of these kings, both in Israel and both in Judah, lead the people so far away from God that it's hard to imagine. And, and because of these evil kings and everybody given into idolatry and not wanting anything to do with God, the people eventually get exiled. First, the northern kingdom of Israel gets taken into captivity by the Assyrians. And a couple hundred years later, the southern kingdom of Judah gets taken into Babylonian captivity. Babylon comes in, they destroy Jerusalem. They go off into captivity into Babylon. But do you know where this all starts? It starts in Genesis 3, obviously. But it starts with this demand to Samuel. Now appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. That's where it starts. Sometimes what we think we want is actually the very last thing that we need. And sometimes it takes great pain for God to teach us a lesson. And then now appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have, has become by the rivers of Babylon. We sat and wept when we remembered Zion, when, when we remembered how good we had it, when we remembered the temple, when we remembered God's holy city, when we remembered everything that he'd done leading us out from the exodus. Man, the times were good then. But now we're stuck by this river in Babylon away from our home, and all we can think about is, is our sin, and all we can think about is how, man, we've asked God for the wrong thing. We didn't want God to lead us. We wanted to lead us, and we've gone so far from where we could be. But whenever we stray from God's will, and when we stray from God's word, when, when, we, when we elevate ourselves over the word, man, we all have these moments. Now, I've never regretted obeying God, but there have been too many times to count in my life where I've regretted not obeying God. So here's my encouragement. Get back to this. Get, get back to the word. Get back to the Lord. Don't depend on other people to save you. Don't depend on other people to lead you. 
It says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 15, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Doesn't say they'll make your path straight. Doesn't say you'll make your path. It says he will. And depend on the Lord, depend on his word, and he will straighten out your path. He will guide you. He will direct you. See, God has done absolutely everything to rescue us and to save us. Even after the exiles, he brings the people back and he blessed them. They rebuild Jerusalem. They start rebuilding the temple, but still the people stray. And finally, finally he sends Jesus. He sends his own son to do life with us, to put on skin. And he lives the life that we never could. He dies the death that we should have died. And it's only through Christ and it's only through his righteousness that you and I can be righteous. If he didn't come and live the perfect life for us, we never would have any hope. All these people through all these years, they, what, God, give us a king. This is the king that they needed, but it's not the king that they wanted. Trust in him. Don't, don't trust in other people. Let him be your king, and I promise you, if, if he's your king and you obey him, you're not going to have these Psalm 137 moments where you're sitting by the rivers of Babylon and you're weeping because you wanted something that was different than he had planned for you. Will you pray with me?